second week of size. And this day is devoted to communication. So we've had interesting discussions about uh, music and about stories. And this panel is about performance. So specifically, it's how do we engage environmentalism through performance? We have uh, three excellent panelists. Um, I'm not going to introduce them except to uh, say their names and their titles. And I'm going to ask each one, if you, if panelists, if you would do this, to tell a little bit about yourself and how you got to where you are. Uh, we have lots of uh, young upcoming fellows in the audience, and they, I think they would really like to hear sort of what your experience was. So our first panelist is Sandra Kaufman. She's director of dance at Loyola University in Chicago. Sandra, please. Oh, hello, everybody. Well, welcome. And I, I just feel so honored to be with the best nerds on earth because I <laughs> definitely consider myself a, a huge nerd and uh, find great comfort in that. Um, so my background is in the performing arts and in dance, um, but I also have a, a degree in education. And um, so I have had a lot of educational theory and I'm very well versed on uh, basically on this idea of communication in, in education in general. Uh, but as my processes began to develop and my career began to go, I became very, very, very interested in using movement to teach scientific principles. Um, and so let me elaborate a little bit on that. So I did an undergraduate degree double major at Northern Illinois University. And then I was a scholarship student at Martha Graham School in New York City and danced with the company and uh, did a lot of you know artistic work um, in dance. But I find a human society very chaotic and oftentimes cruel and, and very difficult to understand. And so uh, definitely have always had a great passion for the work of scientists because I feel like they are trying to get at this universal truth and in many ways the same kind of truth that we're trying to explore in art. Um, but I find the, that um, science is quite beautiful you know I think about the Krebs cycle or photosynthesis or something like that and how it all seems to work so perfectly um, how aerobic respiration and and photosynthesis are in this kind of perfect balance it's it's miraculous and wonderful to me so when I was here you know dealing with the ravages of being a young poor person in New York City uh, I took a lot of comfort in exploring and educating myself as sort of an amateur science aficionado and began making some dances even about science. Uh, so then two major sort of uh, impulse uh, events or project, I don't know how to call it, two major things happened. So the first was that um, I was invited to direct for the Martha Graham School, um, a major reform project in education reform here in New York State called the Empire State Partnership. And the thrust of the partnership was to use the arts uh, to teach core curriculum. And so this was something that I had already been exploring through some other previous um, experiences as a, as a teacher and um, developed a lot of curriculum and did a lot of really interesting projects and found remarkable success using uh, physical mediums to demonstrate scientific processes. So it's not so much dance per se, it can, it's kind of on a, a range of elevating between like sort of acting it out to like maybe something set with choreography and music, right? So, you know, I can go into a first, uh, a sixth grade class and talk to them about Newton's laws. They don't have to do a dance about it, but we're able to see, you know, inertia or, or et cetera. Um, so I had a great time and, and that really got me very, very interested in science communication through movement. And so the next major development in terms of my career and advancement, uh, I w received a um, commission from the Sloan Science and Technology Commission to create a work on superstring theory, which is a theory in theoretical physics. Um, and again, it was spawned by uh, Dr. Brian Greene's The Elegant Universe. So if you can see, I was so already drawn into it, the idea of the elegance of science. And of course, theoretical physics uh, and dance, uh, well, actually, if you think about it, and Newtonian physics and dance are like all the things that we kind of understand, mass, force, acceleration, et cetera. Quantum mechanics, how do you dictate quantum mechanics in dance? Well, we, I made a whole dance about it. <laughs> so in any case, so that kind of took off and, and put me in like sort of another uh, legion of sort of science communication and artists. 
and um, have continued to work with, with Dr. Green periodically. Um, so then I moved to Chicago and um, I began my work at, at Loyola and kind of had to put aside my sort of evangelical championship of, of dance to teach science <laughs> while I was building the dance program here. But this kind of invitation, and I thank you to Thomas and to George for the invitation because this is something that not only do I care about, but I really believe could make a tremendous transformative difference in the way that teaching and learning take place in science. And since this is, panel is on communication and specifically climate change, I think that to engage uh, students of all levels uh, physically, right? So this is the idea of learning by doing and um, acting it out, which I think some of you, I, I, I put together some materials, uh, one of which is this new movement right now, I think it started also in Har at Harvard called uh, Dance Your PhD. And so I sent you an example of come of those, which uh, of course I wanted to get on that immediately, but <laughs> the scientists are doing it themselves, which is even better. Um, and then we were doing a major project with uh, elementary school students on climate change, and I sent also a video of, about that. It's called the Pierce Project, and you can see some cool uh, movement, movement uh, explorations of photosynthesis and, um, and of climate change data uh, done through movement, and one with elementary school students, and then, of course, the Dance Your PhD is with college students um, and PhDs. So, let me just pull it back a little bit and talk about the theoretical framework and then maybe give some different examples. So um, uh, the Harvard psychologist, Dr. Howard Gardner, developed his theory of multiple intelligences, I don't know, I guess about in the early 90s, I would say, is where that came out. And I think that this group, being at your age, you've already probably grown up, many of you uh, here, but not not everybody. We're a, a multi-generational group. but. Um, you know, he kind of came and legitimized other forms of knowing besides linguistic and uh, audiovisual, right? So the way that our entire education system right now is set up, sit in your desk, use your eyes, use the board, read a book with there's words describing everything. Well, the, um, Gardner is saying, well, you know, audio and visual learning is definitely two of the ways that the mind learns, but they've expanded it to nine. It originally was seven. Uh, briefly, I would say, so the seven different intelligences, and he defines intelligence by the ability of assimilating knowledge, creating new knowledge, and problem solving in, mo in these multiple domains. So musical knowledge is definitely, uh, was one of the top ones that he uncovered. Um, uh, spatial, spatial awareness, kinesthetic, which I'm going to talk a little bit more with you about. Um, interpersonal, intrapersonal, natural science, so the ability to sit in nature and perceive the natural world. Um, these are some of the uh, intelligences that he realized. And so as educators, we have to say, huh, if a kid can learn really, really well with music, why don't we use music to teach about science? And again, my particular niche is to use the body. And not just the body, but the body moving in a sequential process. So um, you could give an example of, um, let's say uh, photosynthesis, right? So you've got, uh, or no, let's say a very simple one, mitosis and meiosis, right? How the DNA is gonna split, they sort of reshuffle themselves, they re-choreograph themselves, and then suddenly you've got um, an oocyte, right? Um, so these are all kind of things that mis unfold sequentially and can be demonstrated and participated in by students. And so of, of all ages, um, so Gardner's uh, revolution about kinesthetic intelligence kind of get, got people thinking about a lot of different, a lot of different ways of knowing. And um, again, I believe all of these intelligences, uh, it's like the Einstein quote. He's like, we're all geniuses, but if you judge a fish on its ability to climb a tree, you're kind of missing the point, right? Um, but beyond that, I, I would say that um, kinesthetic knowledge is our, that's how we come into the world, that's how we learn. Before we become linguistic creatures, everything that we develop is through the body. That is our primary mode of obtaining information about our environment and ourself. And so everybody has within them that ability to learn by doing. Um, and then the other people have a, a, a even more aptitude in that way where sometimes somebody who is struggling with 
audiovisual learning. Maybe they're dyslexic. Maybe they, um, uh, maybe this just doesn't click for them. And I don't know if any of you are science educators, but sometimes students, when they're just reading material in a book, it doesn't come to life for them. So our goal is to bring it to life, get them to participate, and give them to visualize uh, these processes in a way that really makes sense to them. And then. Finally, I would say that the other way of um, uh, impacting climate change, so, so I'm talking just about educational theory, teaching and learning, but if we're talking about the, the threat of climate change, you have to get people to care. How are you going to get them to change their way of thinking and behaving and behavior? So there's an educational theorist, uh, Benjamin Bloom, who created a taxonomy of, of knowledge. And uh, it's um, uh, cognitive, affective, and psychomotor. So cognitive co is, is, is all the ways of knowing uh, besides psychomotor and affective, okay? So cognitive is the way that we usually think of school. Um, psychomotor, I think, is, is that idea of learning by doing, right? Developing skills through practice. But the affective domain is the values domain. It is the domain of emotion. And we try in our, I mean, in a way, it's like children are taught from being born that we don't want to see your emotion. We don't care about your emotion. Sit still, be quiet, and take this information while you sit passively at a desk. Um, and this kind of way that I'm approaching it is saying, let's, let's, let's try something very, very different. Let's get them excited about them. Let's get them participating in this. And channel the great ability of the affective domain to change behavior. So it is only through the affective domain that anything is going to change in culture through getting people to care. And so I would say all of our panelists here on the performing arts, I think this is our deep mission, is to not only create accessibility to knowledge, but also create a way of learning that gets you to involve yourself personally and emotionally in this affective way. So, um, so I think that's all I would say for that for now. And then um, I'll let, we'll hear from my, my other distinguished panelists and then uh, maybe somebody has some questions and I'll come back and answer that later. There's, again, there's some supplemental material that um, Thomas has sent to you if this kind of sparks some, any ideas in you and you can, and you can check into that uh, at a later time. So thanks very much for the opportunity to share my great love of science education with you. Andrew, that was fascinating. And I don't, I don't think many of us in the science world have thought of performing arts as a way of teaching. I certainly have never done that in my lectures, but I, I'm eager to learn. Maybe I'll start. Uh, so you, you can contact me, George, anytime. And, you know, and this is something I care so deeply about. I'd be happy to give you a little, take, it, take you for a spin. <laughs> yeah, no, I'd love, to, I'd love to learn more. I'll probably take you up on that. I, you may Great. Be sorry that you asked. I but, hope you uh, do. <laughs> I would love it. I'd be an honor. Yes. Thanks so much. Sure. Uh, let's see, Kristen, uh, I think you're up next. And just to um, let people know who you are, you're the director of choral and vocal activities and senior lecturer at Loyola University. So it's all yours. Yes, indeed. As a matter of fact, recently jumped tracks to assistant professor. Whoa! <laughs> which, is, which is actually, um, sort of a part of my introduction, um, answering the question, how did I get here? Um, and it is something that fascinates me. Um, and I'm, I'm a mother of three, so I see my kids following their own trajectory. But um, I am, uh, you know, I studied voice as an undergrad, went on to study conducting in my master's degree and have done a lot of historical performance. So working with period instruments and singing music written before 1800, which is a very specific repertoire. And, um, and then of course, in my conducting career, conducting all sorts of music from, you know, over, over a thousand years, doing a lot of new music as well. And, um, but along, this this musical trajectory um of course we're also growing as people and i've always been a lover of nature um, hiking backpacking outdoor adventure lived in california for a number of years um, and 
along with that, wanting to always be um, an educated and good citizen. So just all of these things living side by side. And as I started my work at Loyola 10 years ago, I had the great fortune of um, meeting Sandra and also Nancy Tuckman, who is now the Dean of the School of Environmental Sustainability. Um, and we began these collaborations as a part of Loyola's climate conference. Um, and, you know, that was just sort of a small slice of what I was doing at Loyola, along with so, so much of the, the teaching and other performing I was doing. And over these collaborations, I, in exploring repertoire to do and trying to creatively engage myself in this interdisciplinary work that would mean something to the participants at these conferences, um, I just started to go deeper into this area of research and scholarship. And as a part of the process, found that it was becoming very integrated with who I already was as a person. And so this has been a delightful discovery for me. And um, then in, in, in a more uh, recent part of my um, life, I went back to school four years ago to uh, finish my doctoral work, very much like Thomas. We had these parallel educational experiences and um, continued on to get my uh, doctorate in conducting, which I just finished this past spring. Ooh. And in fact, uh, wrote my dissertation on the intersection of um, environmental activism and choral music. And so I hopefully what is illustrated by um, my years in the music field is that um, I'm actually the best example of how music and art and the combination can affect major change. So not only in my work, but just, at, you know, in my own home life, in my parenting, um, I have been able to put all of these important things together. Um, so I guess the big question is how, in fact, does music then fit into the equation of the many facets of activism? And because music is varied and um, multi-dimensional, that question can be answered in a number of ways. And of course, my role is, is very specific in that I work with the voice, both in ensembles and um, in, a, in a soloist sort of capacity, and that I have a very strong classical music background. So I've been fascinated by, of course, we can look to folk movements and um, a more casual element of singing and music performance um, coupled with lyrics as a part of this 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 activist lineage but um, as new music in what you could say the classical idiom has um, gone in so many directions in the last 50 to 75 years how can this more performative repertoire interact, intersect with what I consider to be an all hands on board crisis, right? Don't get me wrong, I'm all for music for music, expressivity, beauty, joy, all that music can be on its own and we need that too. But I honestly wasn't feeling 100% great about just that one piece of what I might be able to bring to the earth table. And um, so through my work at Loyola and now beyond that in some, some additional professional work I'm doing, this has become really central to um, just what I do as a musician and as an educator. Um, in the, the idiom of this performance oriented music, composers are um, responding to this genre in very specific ways. So my dissertation was more specifically, especially on the music of John Luther Adams, who prior to his um, full-time professional work as a composer, 
was um, uh, an exec, a director of an, an environmental agency in Alaska, and then realized, sort of in a way similar to my own path, that he just needed to focus more on his composition. And even though his his um, compositions are not overtly political or necessarily activist, um, you know, with text, but in fact, most of his music is is non-texted. He writes a lot of instrumental works, um, but just because of who he is and what he's trying to create by making music sort of not about place, not about earth, but as place, as earth. And he does this through, you know, of course, music um, at its root is very mathematical. And so looking to nature for models for his motives and for his musical structures um, is one way he um, enters into this, into this universe of sound. Um, but I didn't keep track of how long I was talking. And there's so much <laughs> to be said. There's, there's so much I could talk to you about. But to, to pull that back around to the work I've done at Loyola and more educationally speaking, um, We've been engaged in a number of projects, mostly interdisciplinary, but the last year and a half, because we were doing everything virtually, it opened up a whole new way of doing things where we um, created a number of videos together. I think you received one of the longer projects, which is called Elements, that I did with students at Loyola, some students from the University of Illinois, the three campuses, um, and then a, a small professional ensemble that I've just started called the New Earth Ensemble. So it's a rumination on water. Um, but an earlier project we did this year was called um, Celebrate Earth Countdown to Spring. So it was seven videos, each about different beautiful um, parts of the earth that sort of seven days leading up to the first day of spring. Um, I'd like to just play you a short excerpt of day one, and this particular video is 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 the first video we made after the pandemic shut things down. So we made this in May of 2020, but we we repackaged it for this um, this 2021 countdown to spring, and I'll share just a little bit of of it with you. It's based on a medieval chant. Um, and the text is Adoro Te Devote, which is um, um, adoration and devotion, but the text is about nature and the earth. And then there's a translation of that that comes in later when the singers come in. So I'll play the beginning, skip to the middle, and then just let you hear a little bit of that and maybe figure out a way to share some more of these videos with you later. Um, I'm hoping, I haven't had to share screen and sound for a long time, so I hope this works. <laughs> oh, it's working fine. Okay, well, here we go. So I, I'll, I'll hopefully be able to skip through a couple of spots for you. I'm sorry, it's hard to do this, but I want to 
let you hear some of the middle section. skipping ahead so you can see the final singing entrance. and so on and so forth. Uh, it was really hard to choose an excerpt, but I'll, I'll share that with you. And that was supposed to be a part of a larger project we did last spring of Paul Winter's Misa Gaia. So I used, still used a few of the professional musicians and then we just edited all together and put together the, this longer video. Um, but along with these projects, of course, part of what I do in the classroom then is open up discussions or sometimes Nancy has come to talk to the class depending on the project and the text and the scope we use it to bring in other speakers to talk about whatever issue is brought forth by the actual music um, I'm pretty sure I am way out of my time and so I will um, uh, defer then back to George thank you George uh, Kirsten, no, you're not way out of your time. We really much, very much enjoy the, the video that you showed. It's a revelation, certainly to me and probably to everyone else too. Uh, lots of questions about that. But let's uh, uh, move on. Caesar, you're next up and you uh, are the um, youth coordinator at Chicago Eco Ambassador Program. I think I'll just leave it at that. Really want to hear about your, uh, how you got to where you are. All right. Hey, everyone. It's good to see you again after that reading discussion we had the other day. Uh, yeah, I'm Caesar, a.k.a. DJ Antonio Caesar, um, Youth Program Coordinator at Faith in Place, Creative Director of Planet Chamba, which I'll talk to you a little bit more about. Uh, producer at Solidarity Studios. I do everything that I need to do out here. Um, so how did I get into the environmental field is the first thing that I'll, I'll, I'll discuss. I would say uh, it was probably realistically through when I was a child, I played, I, I was playing in the Chicago Park District, like sports. So I would say first recreation, sports was something to keep me disciplined and out of the streets. That's how it was described to me. Uh, and that's 
at, when you play sports, you're visiting different parks, you know, and it's not environmental particularly, but it, it, it's all going to connect soon. Uh, and then um, I would say moving forward, you know, I'm really into music. I'm a DJ. I started DJing six years ago. So uh, when I started DJing, I was getting into cultural work at Northwestern University. I ended up going to Ghana, West Africa and getting into cultural conservation work. Uh, in this, we hosted a music preservation workshop where we started recording uh, uh, traditional music. And then I was DJing at the radio station there and then going to production houses and sending out these drums to contemporary producers to make these old sounding drums sound new again and sound relevant. Uh, and so why do I tell you that story? Because that was first, I was first in the field of like cultural conservation. Uh, and then I kind of, um, at the same time, I was studying education at Northwestern, program design, learning sciences, uh, with some really amazing uh, uh, um, teachers, professors from Northwestern and Stanford. So that plays a big role because I was also in education, into programming, and eventually it kind of just na naturally led me into the environmental field, just starting from cultural conservation to environmental conservation, because they are, they are so connected. Uh, we talked a little bit about this in our reading group, um, but I feel like, especially with a lot of, the, of, of people from the city, I mean, that's where we start. Like, it, it's culture first, and then uh, it's, it's an avenue to envir environmental work. So that's a little bit about me, how I got here, and I would love to share my screen and um, show you a link of a series that I'm doing. It's called Dancing for Environmental Justice. This is under the brand Planet Chambo, which I am a creative director and DJ. Uh, and I let me share my screen to kind of show you the type of performance that I do. All right, y'all can see my screen. Yep, we got it. Amazing. Let's blast off. So I'm going to stop at the drone shot because if you want to see the drone shot, you're going to have to go onto uh, Planet Chambo on YouTube and check out that drone shot. Um, yeah, so uh, let me share. I have a little like presentation thing. So let me just kind of share that. Uh, let me get out of here. Okay. So where is this? This is the question that <laughs> I want our, our viewers to ask. And it's really funny because, because I have an international perspective, 
Uh, this is actually one of the common questions that are asked, and this is the question that I, I want asked. I want people to inquire, hey, where is this? Going back to international perspective, a lot of people have been like, yo, are you in Africa? I'm like, where in Africa, first of all, are you talking about? Second of all, no, I'm not in Africa. I'm actually three miles away from your house. You can go visit this space. And um, so, so moving forward, like, we're here to ask about a question. How do we engage with environmentalism through performance? So one of the things is that we need to reach not people's minds through arguments, but we need to reach their hearts through joy, curiosity, and fun. I think, uh, um, Sandra, you said a word um, that was emotional learning. You have, you, you have the academic language to describe that. Uh, so I think this is like a really important component of performance that it connects to the hearts. Uh, but second of all, like, like if I were to be honest and real, it's like, I want to do something that is cool. Like, I want you to come just because you're going to come, not because you love the environment. I want you to come to this DJ set. I want you to come to this dance performance because just because of it. And I'm hoping that when you do come, it opens you up to a whole new world because there's obviously intention and programming behind what we do in our, our, our dance performances. Uh, so when a person is captivated by the performance, the next question to think about is how can we invite this person into the space for further creative and or recreational programming? That is the, the thing, right? So someone watches our video, they see our performance. How can I now, like they, they figure out, okay, they're at this location. This is where it's shot. I want to go there. How can I invite you to come to this space? So this reminds me of a quote that I was really working with um, when working with cultural conservation, which is the preservation of ancestral form is meaningless without a genuine development program. So what does this even mean? This means, hey, if I just put this on YouTube and just left it there, I mean, yeah, it's nice, it's pretty, it's aesthetic. However, where is the engagement in this space or with this performance? So following this first episode of Dancing for Environmental Justice, we actually did it at the North Park Village Nature Center. After we shot this, natural opportunities came up because it was just received so well. One of these opportunities was a grant opportunity for Remake Learning Days. Remake how we learn about, about science, about environment, about arts, about culture, about everything. So what we did for Remake Learning Days is we hosted an event following our performance where artists and creatives can come into the nature center and we had beat pads available. We had a microphone to record music and we had a DJ set going. And it was more of an open platform where artists can come in and co-create with each other. Here, there's probably about, uh, this is probably about 70% of the participants. Uh, some left early due to the rain, uh, but these are some of the artists and educators and environmental coordinators that, that came, I would even say, 10 miles, 15 miles away, even through the rain. So the last thing I wanna say is like, um, one of the goals is to connect artists and participants involved in the production to the green space managers and opportunities. So not only do I wanna bring you into space so we can have a good time, now let's please let us meet the people in power, right? So we're using performance as a tool for networking, for connecting, for exploring, um, and, and this is exactly what happened. Uh, and collaboration is just so key. Uh, shout out to Amaris, uh, who is at the North Park Village Nature Center. Shout out to Layla Cabell, who is the youth dancer. Uh, she's part of the youth program that I run and who did that performance. Um, so going back to connecting artists, um, one of the goals is to like, okay, now you came into this space. Now that we connected with the space and the people here, are there more opportunities to do more performances in the environmental context? By the way, I say environmental context because our identities are multifaceted. Maybe, maybe I don't center environmentalism as my main part of my identity. I don't, I know I don't. Family comes number one for me. Music and then environmentalism but I can still use my, my talent in the context of environmentalism to really spread a good message and to continue to do work in this field. So um, as a result of this program, for example, Candice May, 
uh, who works at Faith and Place with me. She's a children book songwriter and storyteller. Uh, she she got three gigs from this performance uh, that she did because she told the story there. Dr. Kalonji and Zinga further engaged with environmentalism in his work at the Rap Lab. Rap Lab, it's a hip hop lab engaging in environmentalism now. And Isaiah Rodriguez, who is the videographer on the program is also engaging in more environmental work due to us just doing a fun production together. So at the end of the day, what is the goal for this program that I'm running, Planet Chombo, Dancing for Environmental Justice? Number one, first is I am understanding who is my niche, who do I serve, and I serve artists. So the goal is to connect BIPOC artists to green spaces for healing, creative, and stewardship opportunities. The second goal, well, let me back up to the first goal. Performers, aren't we, we are like just so used to performing for people. There's a lot of social anxiety involved in these types of performances. So really one of the things that I found really great about goal number one is, number one, we're not performing for people here. We are performing and we are honoring the trees, the nature, the elements around us. That's who we are really performing for. So that stress is down uh, and, and, and that respect for our environment is there. Second, we naturally have to respect the environment when we're working there with our multimedia equipment because, hey, we're dependent on the clouds, we're dependent on the sun uh, for our angles, we're dependent on them for our light. Uh, I remember there was one time when when I was DJing, if you could see on the left side, when I was in that cut, there was a beehive right there. And like, I had to constantly engage with the beehive, not to make sure I wasn't getting stung. I was like, okay, I just wanna make sure I'm honoring them the right way. I, 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 I burned, some, burned some sage for them, sent them some good vibes, and it gave me an opportunity to really interact with the nature around me um, at, at, at this performance. The second goal is to um, showcase green spaces in Chicago one artistic performance at a time. Chicago is seen, and I'm gonna stop sharing. Chicago is seen as an urban jungle, a concrete jungle as they say. Um, however, there are a lot of green spaces in Chicago that we really do not know about because it's not promoted. Uh, the violence is promoted, the negative things about this city is promoted. So one of the goals is to showcase these green spaces to show the communities that are, are, are connected to our artists and our, our whole community as Planet Chombo and all the organizations I work with like, hey, here are some spaces that you can visit for peace, for healing. Here are some gardens that you can visit for fresh food. Here are some nature centers that you can go for for some exercise and a hike. So, that is a little bit about Planet Chombo. That's a little bit about me as a DJ. You can find some of my music on the internet. My, my at name is there. You can follow at Planet Chombo on Instagram to, to keep following up. Uh, moving forward, I have a conversation with the Forest Preserves for a, a, a second episode. And third episode, we're hoping to go to the Montrose, the Montrose Harbor, Marshall's Beach Harbor. So um, thank you so much for having me today. And I'm open to questions during our Q&A. Fantastic, Caesar, and all of the panelists really <laughs> revealing uh, intros that you've given to me. This is all new. And I have a question. I can start the questions if you don't mind. Uh, I have a question for all of you. And the question is this. It's so surprising that you're combining something that's intellectual, usually word based. And, you know, that's how we learn. Uh, and that's how we express ourselves. But with things that are visual, things that are performing. Uh, music. And I wonder, what's the reaction you have seen from the people who you, you've exposed this to? Are they surprised? Do they say, I never thought of it that way? Do they respond? And I've seen this in all three of your sets of comments that, oh, it's fun. Oh, this is interesting. Let me, you know, I'm drawn into it, not intellectually, but maybe emotionally, or just maybe, you know, feels good. So what do you think? And anybody jump in there and take the first crack. I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I'll give an example of a student. So I did my student teaching uh, at a high school here in, in Illinois. And, well, I'm in New York right now, but in Illinois. And um, 
you know, I was an immature teacher. I was not teaching dance. I was teaching a, a health education class, and I was dealing with um, a, a, a hormonal cycle. And some of my students, so I, in, in health education, you have to graduate in Illinois. So some of those kids maybe were mainstreamed. Some of them were maybe had failed it before. Like, so I had seniors who had to do it again really smart freshmen, this whole like sort of mixed bag of kids and they all need to pass this class. Well, some of the students were really struggling. And this was a little bit complex. There was a lot of chemical sequences. So I said, okay, I made the whole room into a human body. And I was like, all right, right here, these are the ovaries. And, and I gave kids a piece of paper. I was like, okay, you guys are going to be the FSH. And then they had to walk up and, you know, you're going to give your hormones and it's going to come over here to, you know, the next step and the next step. So we created this space kind of mimicking the human body, not really, but sort of. And we had them sort of travel through this process. So I had a student, and I, I'll never forget this, this was well before I had ever done anything more like it about, it was 10 years later before I could put this into practice. Um, she came up to me afterwards, she'd been a basketball player, and this is a kid who is not an audiovisual learner. She struggled. People would consider her, I don't know, I don't know how she would have done on her IQ test, but I don't know that anybody was asking her to demonstrate her IQ in the way that she really could, or teaching her in a way that she really understood. So this just meant so much to me. She came up to me after class in tears, and said, oh my God, that is the first time I've ever been able to understand. Ah. And I thought, aha, there's something here. There's something here. And then I haven't been able to sort of pick it up again until then I had the opportunity several years later in New York. But I think about that student so often, you know. So we can really use this to, for those students who seem to be struggling. Like we think, oh, science is difficult. It's like, no, it's, be it's be beautiful. It's miraculous. We're just, all, we're, we're um, congealed into this audiovisual learning mind. And there are many other ways of knowing. Music as a way of knowing. Nature as a way of knowing. Dance as a way of knowing. Who else would like to comment? Well, I was actually going to um, draw on something that Caesar said that I just really, really love. And then also what, what Sandra just said about education. Um, Caesar, when you were saying when you're performing outside that you're really performing to nature and maybe there are people there watching, maybe not, but this sort of this pressure to um, have audience and kind of related George to your question you know what has been the response I think the 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 engagers that are right there in the trenches making the music or making the dance um, are really deeply affected and I've had a lot of feedback from students um, I mean in 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 I think very um, lasting ways you know, more importantly, that also beyond the, the work we're doing for the environment, just that the arts can be used for important messaging. Um, but, but at the same time, with, with the audience, because some of this is performative, that there's also a surprise element that people would not think that this would even be a thing. And so to, to come into a performance space and be moved by some expressive performance, having seen music's power beyond this topic and the way that it infiltrates people's psyche or, I mean, which I'm sure is, is maybe is quantifiable over a period of time. Um, but I, I see that kind of as a long-term awareness and affecting one person at a time and that next person and really building a movement that therefore becomes effective just by scope. Um, so I think it works on various levels and the feedback that I've received over the years from students and people in, in audiences is really moving. And um, yeah, so a lot of answers in there. Fantastic, and I, I, I'm learning from every word. Caesar, any comments? Um, yeah, the question was like, how do people respond? Yeah, yeah. Um, so actually, before making this, one of the one of the things that people were saying is like, I'd always just feature many artists. As a producer, I naturally just feature artists on things. You're like, why aren't you in this? I want to see you. Uh, so I kind of realized how um, important like identity is and your connection to like what you're creating 
is in, in at least in, in my case, everyone's case is different. But the fact that like I was in it too and included myself in a production that I made is like, it, it, it creates an opportunity um, for me to have conversations with people, with, with my community about environmental justice. And it's not only like, it's not like I'm coming up to them and just talking about it. It's like, at least I have something to offer, which is something really beautified in this, this video before we get into this conversation. Because if I just tell someone something, people don't like to listen, like if you're just telling them, you know? So um, I feel like that, that is the response. It's like they're receiving something first that opens up an, an opportunity for more conversation and education. Fantastic, I, I love the responses. I'm looking at the chat. Ashley has a related question. Ashley, would you like to ask her question? Sure, my question is for all the panelists. I just was uh, wondering what your primary, um, what you guys are primarily doing to share your efforts with the communities like via social media, um, events at schools, especially, I'm sorry, it's kind of like what Jennifer was saying, like making sure that it's accessible to all communities, not just like the ones near you. That's a good question, Ashley. I, I, I'm a little bit older than social media. Like social media is not very facile for for me as a Gen Xer. I'm I'm kind of uh, it's okay, but it's not. I'm not as facile with it. Like I'm not on Instagram or anything like that. But uh, Kirsten and I have collaborated on not only um, sort of performances um, it, within our community, but also performances like, well, we weren't able to do it because of unfortunately the COVID catastrophe, but we had a major, major event that we had collaborated on that would have, I don't know, six or 700 people would have seen it. Uh, but then for me again, uh, you know, so we're talking about the arts, but I'm very, very, very um, interested in education. And so we have created a graduate program in our dance, uh, in our dance major. It's a four plus one where you can come in. This is at the behest of Chicago Public Schools, by the way, they contacted us and um, they, they're desperate for dance teachers. And so uh, we have, it's been a, quite a process, but we have created this program where um, uh, they serve a fellowship for a year working in a Chicago public school with a $35,000 fellowship given to them and uh, in order to become uh, certified dance teachers and work in elementary education communities. And then the following year they're hired. And so to me, this is where the greatest impact is gonna happen. We've got our first cohort of 15 dancer, dance students in this process right now. <coughs> And um, we're hoping to, you know, that's really where, because they, they're working with elementary schools within the entire Chicago community. And so that is um, the most exciting thing I can, I, like I'm ready to go now, I'm done. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> um, but, it, but I really do think, in, again, in education, and of course we love performance as well. So I think that sort of one, two of like getting out, getting personal, working in the classroom, but then also doing things that kind of elevate and inspire as well. Ashley, um, just to add to what Sandra was talking about, I, I do think creative ways to engage with education are one of the, the top ways of doing this. And then just general performance for whoever will come and doing as much PR as possible to get people there and be welcoming. Um, but actually, I think one of the most positive things to come out of the pandemic is that we all had to really resort to online material. And that was a real discovery for me. And I think there is a lot more to be done in that way because that way you can have a worldwide audience by sharing things out there and getting your message spread beyond just you know a smaller community. Um, so just to, to add to what Sandra already said. Great comments. and. Uh while I was listening, you guys stimulated a thought in my mind that performer, performers love to perform and they like to be appreciated. I know this, you'll find this surprising, even as a lecturer, I don't do any song and dance stuff, but uh, as a lecturer, I like to have people say, oh, that was interesting. I, I'm, you know, I'm trying to captivate their attention. I think that that motivation is much stronger in people in the performing arts than it is for me. But I can see that as a as a real real driver, and I'm uh, Thomas. You had an interesting point in the chat. Do you want to share that? Actually, 
I, I would love it. Sorry, I would actually, if I can redirect, I would love it if Adele, if you could answer Adele's question, because this is one that I personally always want to know what people think about. Yeah, Adele, I, that was my next uh, comment I was going to go to. Adele, do you want to share your comment? Sure. Yeah. Thank you, both Thomas and George. Um, and thank you, presenters. Uh, I love this talk. It's very interesting. Um, my question was related to environmental music and um, the movement that's growing with that. And do you feel that there's going to be uh, that environmental music runs the risk of pushback from audiences who use music more for escapist purposes and may not want to listen to current issues and hear about like the everyday realities um, when listening to music? Well, I guess um, uh, I would love if our movement became so big that there that there was pushback. <laughs> um, and um, I mean, I've, I've programmed some really intense programs over the years in other areas. Um, and yeah, some students have commented on that. And I, I think that there will always be some people who have a preference in how they use their their time, you know, and some people only want to watch movies that are entertaining, not documentaries or or art films that are have difficult subject matter. So I don't know if there's something to be done if you're dealing with that material. But I do think one of the what I've seen in, in terms of what performers and composers are doing is that there's there are so many ways to approach this. And so programming that also is just flat out beautiful, beautiful music. And, and yet you can also find um, works that, that are dark and scary and terrifying. And you can program that in, in a different way, but, but also music that is celebratory and and moves people to see the beauty around them. Um, and I mean, there's so many ways to engage interdisciplinary um, projects where you can kind of package things and be strategic about what you're trying to do with X performance. Um, but once again, I'm also really, um, you know, enjoyed the other panelists and what they have shared as well. But I like Caesar's idea that yeah, and in some cases, it's just flat out fun. I mean, there's um, there's that element as well, and so I think it's you can come at it from all angles. And when you are approaching a really intense programmatic idea, coming at it from that angle, some people just won't want to come, and that's fine, I think, because you can't program specifically because of those people or change your programming. Um, but music is everything. That's one of the beauties of art. It can be everything, beautiful, scary, inspiring. And we want to have all of that out there for consumption. Great answer. I'm looking at the time. I would like to put one more question if you guys can stay a couple minutes over. Uh, and Jennifer, would you ask your question? Yeah, so my question was mainly regarding um, the accessibility of these green spaces. So I asked someone who has grown up in the city. I know a lot of these spaces, especially like the really like more popular ones, they're really inaccessible to lower income communities because, you know, they don't have the time to get on the train, travel or do these other things. And just like in my own experience, even if there was like a park accessible, nearby something like what happened to me as a kid is my mom would be like oh you can't go to the end of the block because there's like bad people there you can't go to the you can't go to the park nearby because they always hang out there so even as a child I was really restricted in my green spaces so I was just wondering if there were ways that you all thought we could overcome like this barrier for lower income communities thank you so much for asking the question Jennifer and George thank you for curating that question um so yes, when I look at barriers, I look at safety. I, I actually wrote it down because I've seen, seen in your chat, safety, transportation, and, and also sometimes it is knowledge of, of the space. And this is a question that is continually like that. This is the purpose of Planet Chamba to explore that. And 
for me, my approach is this. Um, it's, it's about building community and not only just doing these performances, but offering resources to these performances. So maybe if you, if you cannot make it, if you see this video or something, or you cannot make it to the green space, uh, one of the things is that I'm hoping that this platform can connect if you're a youth to a variety of youth programs that deal with green spaces in Chicago where you can get paid, where there is a moderator educator in the space to uh, help ensure safety. Safety is never, never guaranteed anywhere in Chicago, uh, even in an educational program. However, uh, that is connecting to resources is, is, is one major thing. And second is really uh, building community because maybe the child is not allowed to go or the young person not allowed to go by themselves, but is there an opportunity to get the family involved as well, making it a family, a family affair? Um, but like I said, this is a, a, a question that we are continually like working with, uh, with these performances. But yeah, resources and building community is the thing that, that I am um, currently at and it will evolve. Great answer. And I think Jennifer, you do raise something that maybe gets overlooked that there's some underserved and marginal communities that the kids are not allowed to just simply go out and enjoy you know, nature because of the safety question. I think that that's a really good point. And Caesar, thanks for that answer. Uh, let's hope that changes. Yeah. Uh, I'm looking at the clock. We are out of time and I do wanna respect everyone's time. So thank you to the panelists. You've opened a lot of eyes and ears uh, since we're on video, I guess we can't say that you've opened any no noses, no smells will come through on the internet, but uh, that's another opportunity. And of course, if you're out in, the, out in nature, you, that's a sensation you will certainly feel. But thank you, thank you, thank you for, for exposing us to this stuff. Fellows, thank you for all the great questions. We're not able to answer them all, I'm sorry, but uh, you can always talk with our panelists, I don't remotely by email, various ways. I have the feeling they would welcome the questions. So uh, 